Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tosh Berman, and this is another episode of Tosh Talks. Today, we're going to discuss one of my all-time favorite artists. His name is Scott Walker. And Scott Walker um, is more known in Europe than actually in America, but as the years go on, as the 21st century gets older, more Americans are... um, are aware of Scott Walker. And Scott Walker came from the state of Ohio. And he came to Los Angeles when he was very young. Uh, and he became a singer. Um, he was a teenage singer, uh, mostly doing covering hits of the day. He was never successful as a teenage singer, but he has made records. Um, he also joined a band called the Rooters, who were a surf band of the early 60s, and their famous uh, hit song was Let's Go, which is actually a fantastic record. He played bass on that, uh, on that record. And I believe Scott Walker was the guitarist and bassist for um, a lot of recording sessions in the very early 60s in Los Angeles. Um, he met two other gentlemen, um, who, and they started a group called the Walker Brothers. And the Walker brothers were not brothers. In fact, Walker was a totally um, made-up name. Um, Scott Walker's real name is Noel Scott Ingle. But he became Scott Walker when the Walker brothers um, happened. And uh, the Walker brothers have, did play in the Sunset Strip during the glorious 1965 era of uh, Sunset Strip music. But um, eventually, uh, all three of them moved to England uh, to make their mark and to do recordings. And they were extremely successful in uh, England as well as throughout Europe and in Japan. And the Walker Brothers are known for their huge orchestrated ballads. They're very sort of close to um, the sound of Phil Spector, sort of the, the, the wall of sound. And um, while they're... In the golden years of the, of the Walker brothers in Europe, they became teen idols, specifically Scott Walker, a very handsome, very beautiful man at the time, still is. And um, Scott Walker, um, well, the Walker brothers had successful tours, but it was a time of when you're touring, it's very hard work. They, they didn't have any sound monitors. Everything was kind of primitive at that time. And um, the irony is, even with the Walker Brothers, and though they were teenage idols, their music were definitely not teenage material, or in, if you listen to it, you don't think of it as being teenage pop music. Uh, specifically, the songs that Scott Walker brought to the Walker Brothers. Um, Scott Walker is a very strange figure in the pop music format. Well, a lot of rock and roll guys were into the blues, Scott Walker was into Jack Jones, who's like a famous, um, at the time, a well-known uh, ballad singer or a nightclub singer, like a Las Vegas singer at times. And Jack Jones is very good, but he's not rock and roll or blues. And uh, Scott Walker went against the grain by appreciating people like Jack Jones, Sinatra, Frank Sinatra, and uh, people of that sort. So that was his mindset when he was doing the Walker Brothers, and Walker Brothers did half covers or they did songs that were written for them or songs written by well-known filmmakers, for instance, like Burt Backrack. The Walker Brothers covered uh, Burt Backrack songs with Scott Walker singing lead. Now, Scott Walker has a remarkable singing voice, a baritone. Now as he got older, he got even more of a baritone sound, but uh, he's just a superb singer of ballads, probably one of the best ever. And um, when the Walker Brothers split up, Scott Walker did solo records. And this is where he makes sort of a, a, a very sharp left turn compared to the Walker Brothers or the whole pop market at the time. Um, his music, a Scott Walker record of the 60s, generally was heavily orchestrated, heavily arranged, and um, half of the material was uh, covers, but as, as it went on, he pretty much wrote all the songs. One of the key songwriters that he covered again and again 
during that time was the French, uh, no, excuse me, not French, but uh, of the Belgium um, singer-songwriter Jacques Borel, um, who sang in French and he wrote in French. And uh, Borel is a famous, uh, what Borel is known for is he's a chanteuse, a French chanteuse singer, male singer, but, uh, whose songs told stories, and they're very gritty and very street-like and very sexual. Uh, definitely not teenage material. And, uh, and also wrote about dying. He's a young guy, he died young, but Jacques Brel would cover death, dying, and arrows at the same time. So a, a typical Jacques Brel song, the narrative of sexuality, arrows, and death, uh, was a st strong sense of location of street, place, country, and, um, and time. So Scott Walker discovered Jacques Burrell, um at the, in probably like 67, 66. He started re recording Jacques Burrell songs and put it into his albums. One of the beauty things about Scott Walker is that his first four albums are easy to remember their titles because there's Scott 1, Scott 2, Scott 3. Take a well guess what the fourth album is called. Are you sitting down? Scott 4. So throughout those four albums, except for, except for Scott 4, which Scott 4, I, I, believe, I believe Scott 4 is totally all Scott Walker compositions. He did cover Jacques Burrell. And uh, he actually had a hit song called Jackie, which is a, a Jacques Burrell um, composition. So interestingly enough, in, um, so Scott Walker was like discovering Jacques Burrell. At the same time, or earlier, Rod McKillen, who is a, a poet singer, well, at one time he was America's number one best-selling poet, and I'm not, I don't want to talk about his poetry at all, but the fact is Rod McKeown was an early fan and a friend of Jacques Burrell. I don't, I don't think Scott Walker ever met Jacques Burrell. And, uh, and there's a songwriter named Schumann who was a, 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 a great um, 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 American rock and roll songwriter who went to France right in the middle of his career and started translating Jacques Burrell's songs into from French to English. <clears throat> and I think Walker used some of the translations. I'm not sure. Rod McCune did his own translation, as far as I know. So why am I telling this long story about Scott Walker? It's because Scott Walker is still making records as of this time. He's, I believe he's 75 years old now. And as one gets older, one gets more mellow, gets more, you know, just kind of laid back and, you know, don't really care that much, just coast. Scott Walker does totally the opposite. As he gets older, he gets more nerdy. Not nerdy, he gets more nervy. Excuse me. I'm nerdy. He's nervy. He's getting more extreme. He's taking more chances. And he's, like, going for the throat all the time. So, so the early like Scott one to four was like this one, almost to me like a long one work piece of work, and um, and, and many music fans are connoisseurs of British pop or or, or the connoisseur, uh, uh, the French chanteuse type of uh, singing are were Scott Walker fans. Scott Walker after four made albums off and on in England. Uh, um, for one, whenever Scott Walker opens his mouth and words come out, on a scale of one to ten, at the worst, it's a six. Even the bad song he had to record at the time, it's at le very least a six. So you're never wasting any time with Scott Walker. But for sure, Scott Walker went into decline commercially, and also um, he just made records just to make money, uh, and. Um, and his life was kind of mysterious when I mean, he sort of dropped out of the scene. In fact, Scott Walker is a very mysterious figure. You don't know too much about his private life, who he's married to, who he's not married to, family, you don't know. So anyway, Scott Walker pretty much stayed in London throughout his adult life. He never, I mean, he, if he went back to America, it's probably just to visit his family in Ohio or if he had you know, friends in Los Angeles. But he pretty much stayed specifically in London pretty much throughout his adult life. So in the um, so like starting in the '90s or in the '80s, Scott Walker made an album called "The Climate of Hunter" for Virgin Records, and this album came out of nowhere. Like people almost forgot who Scott Walker is, 
And the music was very minimal, kind of electronic, with the most obtuse, angular lyrics imaginable. And generally when Scott Rocker wrote songs, his lyrics are kind of a story or a mood of sorts. And I'm just going to read you. Okay, first of all, the, my main talk is Scott Walker. The focus really, to my mind, is Scott Walker, Sundog, Selected Lyrics, put out by Faber and Faber. This came out. And first of all, I'm a huge fan of lyric books. When you hear a song, you hear the lyrics, that's one way of hearing it or, or, or obtaining it. Second is like when, if, they, if they print the lyrics on the album sleeve, that's another way so you sort of follow the song. More likely, if you're, listening, if you're reading it in a book, like an edited, selected lyrics book, you're getting another dimension of that song, of that artist as well. So some people think, well, hell, why do I need a book of lyrics? Because I can get it off the album or if it may be printed on the album. And a book, a, a record's a record, reading lyrics on an album sleeve is reading records on an album sleeve, but a book's a book, totally different medium. And I've emphasized on my past shows how each medium is different. TV is different from movies, movies are different from DVDs, and so far. CDs are different from vinyl. They're all different. So whenever you hear something on that medium, it's a totally new piece of work. So reading the eclectic lyrics of Scott Walker is another way of approaching Scott Walker's work that's totally new to me and totally fresh. It's not the same. And uh, so going back to the subject matter, like early solo Scott Walker, um, Scott Walker has this beautiful song on Scott number four <laughs> called Boy Child. And I'm just going to read, I'm going to read the lyric because I want you, there's a big difference in it. Not a big difference, not a big difference, but there is a difference in, um, in his, uh, how he approached his material and his work. I feel, one, that Scott Walker has not changed that much. There are fans who are early, uh, uh, fans who are early, who are fans of the early Scott Walker, and there are fans of the later Scott Walker, which is more experimental and more abstract. In my mind, it's all one piece of work. And even those years between the Scott Walker albums, I don't think of the Scott one, two, three, four being separate works. I think it's like Scott Walker in general. And to this day, when I hear a new Scott Walker record, I still think it's part of one, two, three Scott, as well as the Walker brothers. He does not eliminate his past. He changes. But it's almost like the same piece of work. He works very slowly. So this is a song he wrote in the 60s called Boy Child. I'm going to read the lyrics to you. You lose your way. A boy child rides upon your back. Take him away through mirrors dark and blessed with cracks. Through forgotten courtyards where you used to search for you. Old gets a new life. Reach out, you can touch, it's true. He's not a shadow of shadows like you, you see. Hearts hold on holding. If you stay one, you stay free. Go seek the lady who will give, not take away. Naked with stillness on the edge of dawn, she strays. Night starts to empty. That's when her song begins. She'll make you happy. She'll take you deep within. Window lights for wanderers. Hide hard in your swollen eyes. Echoes of laughter hide in the city's thighs. Love catch these fragments swirling through the winds of night. What can it cost to give a boy child back his sight? Extensions through dimensions leave you feeling cold and lame. Boy child must in trouble because he came without a name. That's boy child written in the, sometime in the late 60s. And um, beautiful song. When you hear him singing this song with the incredible melody, the way I'm talking about or reciting his work is definitely not Scott Walker-like. It's more Tosh. And that's you just take the Tosh as you take it. But when Scott Walker sings these lyrics, it's like um, it's like it's it's like it's like a, a really sharp hot, hot knife cutting into like melted butter. It just oozes, just cuts right through. It's so beautiful. 
And the early Scott Walker recordings are kind of goosebump beautiful, the way he sings, the way the orchestration comes on, the arrangements. And Scott Walker is an author, and I think that's an example how much he thinks about his words to his songs, his lyrics. And um, not only because it's the mood it fits, but the, he, 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 he designs his words, I think, like a, like, a, like a sculpture, like poetry. And people get kind of sensitive or weird when you talk about lyrics and then poetry. Again, like TV, video, DVD, different medium. And poetry is definitely a different medium than lyrics. But, and I think, and I'm pretty sure if Scott Walker looks at his words as not lyrics, as the book says, selected lyrics, but I feel that his work, when you read on a, pa a paper, it does read like poetry. Um, it stands on its own, even though when you read it, if you know the song, when you read it, the melody comes in your head. But still, if you could separate the melody from the words, it does stand on its own. It's very beautiful and very you know, profound. And, um, and, and as I said, it's, it's words built like sculpture. And a sculpture, like a 3D sculptural piece, which sculpture is. And I find poetry like sculpture. And um, what's interesting, got, when you start making music in the 90s, he made Climbing of the Hunter, and then 10 years later, he made another album. And then 10 years later, he makes another album. And the later work is not so huge, different from each other, even after 10 years. I mean, one, one, one wonders why does it take 10 years to make this record? And my understanding, what I read of interviews with Scott Walker, <clears throat> is that he, the music is easy for him. Putting the music together is not hard, but putting the words together is very difficult, or it's a slow process for him. He cannot do it right away. So, and when you read his work in the book, especially, but also when you hear the songs, each word, each, even the pronunciations is important. In that way, he's very much almost like a Dada, um, uh, a, a Dada or a letterist writer in the fact that the, it's not just the words, what they mean, but also how it's pronounced and how he defines that word in his song. And when you read it, read the book, I think you should keep that in mind that he does think of each word as being equally important as the other word. And one thing that's interesting about Scott Walker, the later works, lyrically, is that it got more involved with um, not feelings between man and woman or how I feel in the world. Like a lot of Scott Walker early songs have that presence of the handsome singer walking into this world, this, this stage, and it's how he reflects on there's a bird there and there's a beautiful woman there and how they merge together and there's Jacques Brel talking about death and, and that type of stuff. The thing about Scott Walker that changed from that to Scott Walker now is that he, I think, start reading more. I think he, he I think he's a well-read person in the very beginning, and very film literate. I mean, this is a guy who is a Criterion DVD person for sure, and I would say his writing taste, his reading taste, is probably all Evergreen, Grove Press, Olympia Press uh, titles of the 60s and 50s and 70s. So he's totally geared, as an American, totally geared to Europe, has very little American interest, except characters like Marlon Brando comes up once in a while, has a song called Brando. So anyway, so now um, Scott Walker, I think, likes to read political history or study history. And it comes through his later work, especially his later work. Um, the early works that he that he quotes from are like European films, like Bergman. Um, Bergman imagery comes up in the, in Scott one, two, three, and four. The later works he does not forget those people, including like Pasolini, the po Italian poet Pasolini. But he also he 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 talked about these people in a more historical context of their time and place, and that including the politics of that place and time. And to tell you the truth, I have very I have basic knowledge of what happened in the world the last 50 years, but by no means am I an expert, nor am I totally aware of what, why, what, and how these things take place. But Scott Walker, I think, knows a great deal about East European politics and communism, socialism, capitalism, and all what that entails and means. And um, so as he starts writing, he, his, his writing becomes not like historical lessons or or writing what happened exactly, 
but more impressions of what happened. Like he has a song called Clara, which is about uh, Mussolini being executed or, or killed and hung with Clara. Clara, I believe, was his mistress and his wife. And they were hung in a piazza in Milan where uh, they were shot first when they're dead. They're hung upside down. And the crowd just totally like smack the body, cut it up, tear it up, all that stuff. Very violent. And a lot of those Scott Walker later songs have a great deal of violence. Now, what makes him go beyond that, that serious subject, is his sense of humor. And the way he puts little humorous phrases in this horrifying scenes of this total grotesque horribleness is like a work of genius. Like all of a sudden he's talking about some dramatic thing that's happening that's like really horrendous. And then he says, what's up, Doc, in a Donald Duck voice all of a sudden. And when you hear that, it's like total shock. I mean, I never heard anything more shocking in my life. People say the Sex Pistols were shocking. People say, you know, when they heard first rock and roll was shocking, Little Richard, maybe the case. But you have to hear Scott Walker say, what's up, Doc, in a Donald Duck voice. In this, right in the middle of this horrendous, vicious, violent imagery that he brings up. And um, that is like a work of genius, the way he does that. And I can't think of another, first of all, I can't even think of another writer like Scott Walker in music lyrics or in poetry. He's a genius at juxtaposition of images, and you just get the sense of dread. And then when you listen to the music, the music has... It's not a melody anymore. It's not like a catchy tune. He doesn't do catchy tunes anymore. It's basically, it's like a cinematic, when you hear his music, you see it, you hear it, of course, but you can feel it. And you feel it because of his words and the way his great voice is, takes over the whole landscape. But the music is also very minimal, very um, um, ugly noises, a lot of ugly, ugliness, but with his beautiful voice on top of it. So he's a genius at juxtaposition of ugly with beauty. And that would make Scott Walker, I think, a totally brilliant, that makes one of the things brilliant about Scott Walker. And um, I'm going to read you one, I'm going to read you another piece here. Um, it's kind of long, but I, it just points out the difference between like the early years of boy child to what, he, what he's doing now. And this piece also expresses his sense of humor, even though the piece is very dark. And um, it's called SDSS 1416 plus 13B. Very catchy title. Or subtitle, Zircon, a flagpole sitter. And I'm just going to, if I interrupt, I'm just going to explain some of the imagery in case. Uh, not you will miss it, but uh, maybe not obvious. Now, a flagpole sitter was a trend in the 1920s where um, people will, will go crawl up on a flagpole, like a skinny flagpole, and sit on the very top, which cannot be very comfortable, one. Two, it must be very difficult to climb up, or you have to climb a pole up. And the, the, the thing is, people climb up a, a flagpole and stay as long as possible, you know, a couple hours, Two days, three days, and at the time the media would play up on people who will stay, who, who the longest stayed up on a flagpole. And this was during the Depression 20s or the Rolling 20s. So it, that practice, which is to, totally meaningless really and totally stupid, has a profound, perhaps a profound meaning in the 1920s slash 1930s, the, just the eve of the Great Depression. So you have to keep that in mind. See, that's the juxtaposition. You know, the flagpole, something so stupid in a very serious economic disastrous or boom time. The genius of Scott Walker commented on this. So I'm going to read this. Um, just bear with me. I'm not Scott Walker. I don't have the voice. But just pretend. This is my job. I don't come around and put out your red light when you work. What's the matter? Didn't you get enough attention at home? If shit were music, you'd be a brass band. Know what? You should get an agent. Why sit in the dark handling yourself? For Let Lavina, who goes like Yozone, 
these are actually, uh, these are Roman numerals I'm, I'm, I'm repeating, it, it, at least the way he prints it. Nine, one, five, nine, three, five, one. For the citizen whose joke lays in their hand, one, five, one, five, nine, nine, three. To pay, to play fuges on Jove's spam cassinets, five, nine, nine, one, six, nine, one. Cattle are slaughtered, entrails examine, expread, spread out across the moon. Tatiza is rising, topless bars overflowing, pulsing through the flumes. Drop kick. Calarantras, fouling my ears, bypassing. An exotic ski sky and scar jumping grafters. Sharon crying, how can you stoop so high? For Papira, who plops the path on. Nine, six, nine, five, one, nine, one. For gross gulls who won't leave our sheep alone. Five, one, seven, nine, one, nine, one. Norsemen, do not eat the big pink mint. Flush hard, it's a long way to Athens. Gone from your wooden palace, the wild mice pelt clothes. Zip from my toes where termites scribble the walls. Twist it forth and gone, little father. The snip off your 999. From where you groom yourself too small. No more dragging this wormy anus around on shag piles from Persia to Tress. I've severed my reeking gonads. Fed them to your shrunken face. Janice head, it said, will give a good door. Nine, nine, five, nine, one, nine, one. For a Roman who's proof that Greeks fuck bears. Five, five, nine, seven, five, nine, one. Heard this one? This will kill you about the ropes of hair, care of Venus, the bald, tugging murks across the plain, those measuring road rash bellies, a per de do for de may to me, night and day, the one about the saint, stranded high up upon his pillar, 30 summers, 30 winters, his constant visitor, his mother, but he'll stare into the distance, ignored her calls from down below. Did you ever throw your own mother's food back at her? Did you ever tell her to take this junk away? What kind of unnatural son would do that to his own mother? I'm going to stop there just for a second to explain that this was uh, uh, Meyer, the, the head of, uh, of a Hollywood studio. This is a quotation from him. In what context, I don't know, but Scott Walker got exact quotes from him. The tasteless one about the bantam who couldn't climb a rung your helipus is scrap heap, gone. The brown slug of your tongue. Friedrich Ron, who sleeps at night across the emperor's bedroom door. Three, five, nine, nine, one, five, one. Gosontin Gorbi requires fresh packing. Two, nine, five, one, four, Nine, one, over. It's over. Shrink screaming all around. Bar, 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 bar. Bar, 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 bar. A quill, a toast, a quill, a toast, screaming all around. Filling up my life, screaming all around. Bar, 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 bar. Bar, bar, bar. Over. 
it's over. Your nibbling can't be found. They're shadowless shadows, wiping me, wiping me clean away. Bar, 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 bar. The scent of pine torches, the lumbering caravans, caravans, the lumbering caravans, the felt covered wagons moving like galleons, the wedgie, the melvy to threaten the air, only fledge muffled, long hollow bone drums a beating. The dark day behind us, the dark day ahead, the wind drone across skull goblets. Len. Basel come, Strasbourg come, Frankfurt come, Speyer come. I hear the only place you ever invited is outside. If rains were rain, you'd surely be a desert. Look, don't go to a mind reader, go to a palmist. I know you got a palm. Does your face hurt? Because it's killing me. Loss to Los Lombugo City. I am perched against the sky. A banner show of spirals sway in the twilight. Down there as Ishikabish ship the shade forever. Earth's hoary Vontel weeps softly for a thumb trust. A chorus of threadbare black stockinged legs is fanning out into a frazzled black rose. No, Felix fleeting like zippers of blood. Red plumes noting between the horse's ears. Hey, buddy, give it up. Hey, pal, come down, join the living. Want it. A lisping, hobbling, noiseless runt. Phone. Nine. Nine. Nine, 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 one. Remember, someday you go far if you catch the right train. How about, you're so fat when you wear a yellow raincoat, people scream taxi. Then there's, you're so boring that you can't even entertain doubt. I'll grease this pole behind me. Grease this pole behind me. Grease this pole. Grease this pole. There's an unfinished rumor doing the rounds. It seems the storks are seen returning to the rooftops, carrying back their children, clacking like dried palms, loud enough to be heard from Rems to Orleans. River banks are cleared, bridges retaken. Olivion, driven from the city, street by street, so why have screams of laughter, the pissing stench of mare's milk beer, come to bait your toad down from its toadstool, and if I'm melancholic, and if I shred a tear, don't forget to blink, at least your eyeballs dry up, fall out of their sockets and dangle by your cheeks like Caesar's shivered clangs. It's when I hear a sawed-off coffin rolls beneath the tzatzitha. Hey, bar. Ah, my noblest music. Hey, bar. 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 I'll grease this pole behind me. Grease this pole behind me. Grease this pole. Grease this pole. Over. It's over. But where's the electrons? Squeezing all around. Burning up my life. Squeezing all around. Over. It's over. And actually, the poem goes on, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. And uh, the lyrics, excuse me. And again, I just want to mention that the quote I gave um, was from um, was from um, was like a, from a Hollywood it's from a Hollywood um, uh, studio head. 
and I believe it was, it was, uh, it was Meyer. And so when you read the book Sundog, which also includes a new work that's not been recorded as lyrics, uh, this is a really remarkable book. Uh, it's a must for your, if you're a Scott Walker fan like me and like for you, for instance, perhaps. But it's important to get this book if you are a Scott Walker fan because it's another textual reference or another way of looking at his music and his words. And Scott Walker is pretty great. And this is Tosh Berman, Tosh Talks. Thank you. <laughs>